Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Leonard Peltier's Tati Wakua Book Club. Tonight, we have honored and special guest, Professor Ward Churchill. And um, Ward is a prolific American Indian scholar and activist, and he is a founding member of the Rainbow Council of Elders and a longtime member of the Leadership Council of Colorado. In addition to his numerous works on indigenous history, he has written extensively, extensively on US foreign policy and the repression of political dissent, including the FBI's COINTELPRO operations against the Black Panther Party and the American Indian Movement. Um, five of his more than 20 books have received human rights awards. And um, he's the former chair of the Ethnic Studies Department until July of 2017. And he was a tenured professor of American Indian Studies at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, and he received numerous awards there and for his teaching, his um, and service. And Professor Churchill um, was also the national spokesman um, for the Leonard Peltier Defense Committee back in the 90s when um, Bob and Paulette <laughs> um, were um, running the national office in Lawrence. And tonight we will be dis discussing COINTELPRO, which is the FBI's counterintelligence program. And um, I would really recommend if you um, that you get um, his, he has written two books that I know of. And one of them is Agents of Repression. And the other was, is the COINTEL Pro Papers. And I found them on Amazon and there he's holding it up. And so I just wanna welcome you and thank you so much for coming this evening. Welcome. Yeah, well, it's my pleasure to be here. So you want a little uh, sketch of COINTELPRO, counterintelligence program. That's what it's a cryptonym because it was a secret program. They would call it an acronym, but that's for things that are publicly known until it was sort of exposed by a black bag job, as they call them, a burglary uh, committed on an FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania in 1971. It was secret, so cryptonym, but also a misnomer because it was not counterintelligence they were engaged in, never was. Counterintelligence, actually the FBI has a mandate to engage in that, and that has to do with dealing with spies, saboteurs, agents of foreign powers, usually hostile foreign powers, but, you know, there's a few examples one can draw on where so-called friendly foreign powers have been an object of it as well because they were spying on the U.S. Perhaps with the collaboration of certain elements of the, the federal government. COINTELPRO was actually always a counter-subversive program, which means it was combating ideas. It was using counterintelligence techniques and that's interesting. Counterintelligence, since it's aimed at uh, foreign, non-US elements operating within the society, can use techniques and tactics which are, or were at least, legally forbidden for application against uh, US citizens. They use the techniques, but they use the techniques to combat what they considered politically objectionable, unacceptable ideas, usually on the left. Occasionally somebody on the right would get out of line, embarrass them, and so they would apply these techniques to them, but mostly what they considered to be the left. Uh, it evolved in terms of the application of techniques to the point where it was not simply counter subversion that was going on, but and you have documents that are, uh, arise from the case or the application on Pine Ridge, which of course occurred after COINTELPRO was exposed and supposedly uh, terminated, 1971, 72 at the latest, it was supposedly defunct, but we're talking 73, 74, 75, 76, okay. And they're no longer, they have been referring to their targets as uh, political extremists, hate groups, this, that, and the other thing. On Pine Ridge, 
you begin to see them referring to insurgents and what you got going. There's antecedents to this, particularly against the Black Panther Party, but they're engaged in a counterinsurgency operation. That's a warfare technique. It's taught at Fort Bragg, soon to be renamed, um, in a special warfare school and several other locations abroad where they did specialized training in various aspects of their operations. But it is not got a thing to do with law enforcement per se. It's got to do with physical repression. Uh, if you can augment it, and it always is augmented with non-physical aspects, psychological warfare, uh, neutralize is the objective of a COINTELPRO or a counter subversion or counterinsurgency. Neutralize your target. If you can do that by contriving a case as they did with Leonard Peltier and as they did with others, you still got Panthers in prison even longer than Leonard. And that's a long time. Somebody that's been placed in a cage by the extra legal utilization of the judicial system is neutralized. Somebody who is discredited, cast a technique they use with bad jacking where you had people who were federal operatives who created the impression that bona fide activists, genuine activists were federal operatives. Well, <laughs> destroyed their capability of engaging in the, the political work that rendered them injectionable and they were thus neutralized. Intervening in people's uh, family and community circumstances, rumor mongering, whispering campaigns, fomented. We got enough of a problem that within our own communities, but they would go in specifically to foment um, hostility between members within groups, exacerbate personality disputes, create the impression that people were uh, ripping off pocket change out of fundraising activities and sometimes larger amounts of money. Basically spreading false impressions about genuine activists in order, if nothing else, to impair their effectiveness Neutralization and the techniques that went into it ran that full gamut up to fomenting active violence between groups. You had that with the Panthers, but you also had it in a different form with the outright counterinsurgency campaign on Pine Ridge, where you had the so called goon squads, the goons, guardians of the Oglala Nation, as they called them, who were organized to engage in physical repression of people also resident to the reservation, plus people who have been called in to support them in their resistance to uh, federal imposition, the fight for sovereignty. Well, the AIM people were the targets of the goon people. The goon people reported to a federally installed uh, tribal president by the name of Dick Wilson. Uh, used federal highway funds misappropriated to pay goon squad on the east and west. There were two major components to it, subgroups, but a uh, considerable number of those who were prominent goons were also members of the Bureau of Indian Affairs Police Force on the reservation. Now, all of this was being coordinated in a way in a very direct way by the FBI. The FBI provided intelligence to the goons as to where, well, for starters, who particular targets were at a given time, who they were and where they were, and provided weaponry, provided uh, things like armor piercing ammunition, uh, communications gear, but the intelligence was key. And also immunity, because the FBI had preeminent jurisdiction on Pine Ridge, as it does on all American Indian reservations, on, pursuant to the 
Major Crimes Act of 1887. It's been evolving ever since then. The FBI result, none of at least 69 member uh, murders of a members and supporters during the three years starting with Wounded Knee, during Wounded Knee. So say March of 1973 through March of 1976, death rate on Pine Ridge was proportionally the same as it was in Chile during the uh, Pinochet repression of the left following the coup down there. Uh, during that period, according to the FBI's own data, the uh, uh, Uniform Crime Report, Detroit, Michigan was the murder capital of the country. And I don't remember off the top of my head what the death rate or murder rate in Detroit was, but it was six or seven times higher on Pine Ridge than it was in the supposed murder capital of the country. And the FBI had basically solved none of those homicides, although they had preeminent responsibility for doing. Uh, FBI has argued back, well, they didn't need to because the local police in Martin, South Dakota apprehended the people who killed one aim guy and so on. That's not the issue. The issue is you've got all these murders happening on the reservation where Martin, South Dakota has no jurisdiction and the FBI didn't resolve, didn't resolve any of them. Remains the case uh, to this day. And you've got a couple of times recently when um, tribal government on Pine Ridge has tried to reopen some of that and it's really gone not much of anywhere. And that was that was the role. Now, COINTELPRO, the disclosure of it led to major set of hearings, the congressional uh, senatorial investigation during the mid seventies by the Senate Select Committee, called the Church Committee, um, in popular usage, and they found, you know, COINTELPRO was on its face and in detail illegal. Of course, they constrained the details to a considerable extent, but they opened up quite a lot of information, all based on FBI documents, which they compelled to be disclosed, and testimony of FBI personnel, that it was a criminal enterprise that was run from its formal incept date was in 1956 against the Communist Party USA, but they added other targets along the way. Uh, more informally, because they never had a formal caption on it, they targeted the uh, Puerto Rican independence movement, both on the island and on the North American mainland from pretty much the same time, the Socialist Workers Party. And again, without a, a formal classification, the civil rights movement, uh, primarily the Southern Christian Leadership Council, but other, other organizations within that as well. And then the Black Liberation Movement, once that's get rolling, Black Power and so forth, um, during the late 60s, going into the early 70s, AIM, however, presented them with a because of the Pine Ridge connection presented them with a kind of a unique opportunity because it was out of sight and out of mind, remote from most centers of political activity in the United States. And they were able to field test um, several counterinsurgency programs that have been conjured up by a Army colonel by the name of uh, Louis G. Frieda, who upon retiring was picked up by Governor Ronald Reagan during the late 60s in uh, California. And then when Reagan became president, he became, uh, G. Frieda is brought aboard as the first director of FEMA, which gives you some indication of what FEMA is really about. It's not uh, hurricane relief or 
they do that because it's a good cover, but emergency that they're talking about had to do with a civil revolt. And his idea was to utilize the intelligence apparatus, the police apparatus, those other components in combination with the National Guard, the military, and uh, private patriotic groups in concert uh, to quell political insurgencies, uprisings, disturbances, whatever you want. Uh, he had a couple variations of that that he worked out for Reagan that were uh, codenamed Cable Splicer and Garden Plot, and they field tested both of them on Pine Ridge. And then, you know, he worked them up from there. FEMA tested them under, I believe it was, uh, the code name was Rex 84 in that year. Why they chose Rex, I don't know, Tyrannosaurus Rex, whatever. But that one was not applied. On Pine Ridge, they were able to apply it to lethal effect, try the various techniques, field test things, pick up glitches in communication, coordination, how it should be structured and, and so forth. And uh, basically, it ran its course. Now, the church committee had never looked at any of this. And they were scheduling hearings having to do with what was happening on Pine Ridge and the FBI operations against AIM at the time of the Oglala firefight. And a couple things happened. It appears that the operations on Pine Ridge, the installation of Dickie Wilson and all the rest of it had to do with acquiring the uh, so-called Sheep Mountain Gunnery Range, which is about one eighth of Pine Ridge Reservation in the Northwest corner, because they had through satellite photography and specialized film and so forth, discovered that there were uranium deposits there and they wanted control of those. And also there was, when they examined it closer, molybdenum deposits intermixed with it. And what happened was at the same time the Oglala firefight captures attention and you got this flood of FBI personnel, military style, onto the reservation to put the, re the uh, resistance down once and for all. Dickie Wilson signs over the gunnery range to the feds who make it an attachment to the Badlands National Monument. The other thing that happens is because two FBI agents were killed, you know, the sensitivity of um, the church committee was such that they postponed the hearings on AIM and they've never, the postponement is ongoing. The church committee is still, you know, it's, it's author authorization, it's mandate, whatever, remains in effect, but nobody's following up on it. Don't expect them to. So they killed the investigation of AIM and acquired the property, both in conjunction with the firefight, which resulted in the deaths of the two agents, Kohler and Williams. Garner's considerable national sympathy results in Leonard Peltier being imprisoned. And at that point, they could walk away from it. I mean, when they put 250 agents militarily equipped, onto Pine Ridge, there wasn't enough left of the movement at that point really to stand up to that kind of an onslaught. That would have been uh, a replay of Wounded Name, but in much grimmer terms. And the rest, as they say, is history. There are, as I pointed out, a number of people, Peltier being a prominent example, but we've had Panthers. The longest serving one was uh, Chip Fitzgerald who died uh, not too long ago, a couple months ago, having gone to prison in 1967, if I recall correctly, and had been there ever since. And you got uh, Sundiata Ackley who just came out of prison, he's 85 years old. 
um, suffering dementia and all manner of health problems. They cut him loose, expecting him probably to die soon. Uh, Maroon uh, Schultz, they released him two months before he died. He got several instances um, where people were released just in time to die. In fact, you had the one one of the angle of three, three who was allowed out two days before his death. And the uh, prosecutors, the Louisiana prosecutors, Mangola were trying not to release him even then. They wanted him to die in prison. So you got people who are spending 40 and 50 years as a result of COINTELPRO. In a number of cases, these are totally trumped up cases that were brought against him. False evidence submitted, exculpatory evidence withheld, and all the rest of that. So that's on one side of the ledger. The other side of the ledger is there's no FBI agent who's ever spent one minute in lockup as a result of what the church committee found to be a systematically criminal operation that was ongoing for well over a decade. And the truth of the matter is, and that's in the committee records, although the FBI said that uh, COINTELPRO had been terminated by the time the church committee hearings had begun. They found at the time of the of the hearings themselves during that process, at least five and possibly more operations that were ongoing that were not classified as COINTELPRO, but should have been. So COINTELPRO continued. It continues today, although in its two-day continuation, that means it's been continuing throughout the entire intervening period and part of that continuation is a continued evolution. It's evolved. It's much more technically proficient now, much more in, entrenched and intractable and much less paid attention to, generally speaking, than COINTELPRO itself was towards the end. You've also got the reality that although the INCEPT date, as they call it, the date they first began to use cryptonym and to regularize the program, the antecedents to this go back to the very beginnings of the FBI with the operations against Marcus Garvey and the uh, African Blood Brotherhood and so on. But even from there, you can trace the antecedents back to the techniques employed or developed and employed by the Pinkerton Detective Agency, which is the uh, precursor. And it was contracted by the Justice Department, which had no investigative uh, capacity of its own at the time. So it was privatization kind of scheme. The Pinkertons were employed to do the work of the Justice Department and they, they did it with techniques that were picked up by the FBI, carried on forward, routinized or regularized in secret fashion in the 50s and 60s and carried on in the 70s and up until today. Yeah, that's the general overview of COINTELPRO. And with that, I'd kind of like stop being a talking head and see what you want to want to get into in a little more detail. Sorry if that was a bit sketchy, but we have limited time, so I'm covering a whole lot of material as rapidly as possible. How shall we proceed? Well, I think we have a few people who have questions. Um, <laughs> and Kimberly, if you're good with that, we can go ahead and, and let people ask a couple. I think, Don, you had a couple of questions, right? Uh, yes. The first one, uh, would you be willing to put out electronic books? They're a lot easier to study. Would I be willing to, be put, willing out to put out electronic books? An electronic book? They're a lot easier to study. You can highlight things, leave notes. If you right. are willing to, I would be thrilled to format them for you. I can talk to you about that later if you want. 
But um, the issue here is other than things that are out of print, which I hold rights, and there's a fair amount of that, but not that much going in this direction. Uh, we've got some publishers to deal with. It's not my call. I got the copyright okay. as long as the book's in print. And it may be that the two that were just re, um, reprinted from 1988 and 1990, and then they had classics edition from South End Press. It came out like in 2003, I believe. In any case, they were completely out of print until Black Classic Press picked up these two. So the issue right now with those two would be whether Black Classic is interested in doing that. They might be. Okay. I've got one more question. You said that they seek to deny us our democratic rights. They've torn up the Constitution as far as Leonard goes. You know that. Yeah. Uh, you said that they are formidable and dangerous, but not insurmountable. If we could grasp their methodology, we right. can defeat them. Could you expand on that a little bit? I was talking to David earlier. I know one of their tactics is divide and conquer. That is working really well right now. <laughs> it's been working really well all along. You know, like I said, with the whispering campaigns, we got enough of that in our own community, discrediting one another over personal jealousies and jockeying for non-existent power and so forth. You know, we create the context in which they can come in and do devastating work. So that would be a piece of it. Not in, huh. I'm sort of getting enraged thinking about this. Sorry, loaded question. <laughs> yeah, but there, there's just an endless supply of behaviors. How many pointless debates on the nuances of the dialectic are we going to have to endure from people who fancy themselves to be experts without even knowing what the hell a dialectic is? Exactly. Okay. Couldn't do. What can they we do? define dialectic as such if their life depended on it, but endless, endless in citing scripture from one or another of the canonical saints of the opposition from another century or two centuries ago and other hemispheres and all the rest of it. Maybe we ought to look at our immediate circumstance, but mostly. You know, there's a whole attitude that you're going to somehow take this system of oppression that perpetrates genocide, continental scale land expropriation, all the rest of the things that we list as complaints, and somehow thinking that the key to fixing all that lies within the system that created it in the, in the first place. All right. And that, that's the status quo with the so-called left or the opposition or the whatever you want to call it. I had a, it goes, it goes beyond that. I had experience in where was it, Portland, Oregon, some years ago. And they used to bring me out there to talk to all these anarchists from up in that area, green anarchists and the you know, heavily anti-authoritarian types. And so I'm meeting with this little group out in the courtyard, and we're talking about ways and means of expanding the outreach of, of the ideas to appeal to people other than the, the same people showing up. Why are we always talking to ourselves? I said, well, you know, you probably might want to start with uh, not conducting yourself in the manner of missionaries and going in and tell people what's wrong and what they need to be doing in order to fix it and how they need to adjust their lives to conform to your ideas. You might ask them what their priority is at the moment and support them in that, even if it's something doesn't make a lot of sense to you, even if it's something that 
up to a point at least, you object to. It's a case in point right down the street, you know. You got a bar, which is a working class bar. It's a neighborhood bar. It's a focal point of social activity from which the locals have been essentially driven out or rendered uncomfortable by the passage of a local no smoking ordinance. And if you don't want to smoke, don't go in. But don't take that away from them on the outside chance that somebody's going to have car trouble and need to go use a pay phone in there, you know? And they're actually up in arms and protesting it. You might step in, you know, and support them in that. And the sort of head of this leaderless group looks at me and says, oh, but I agree with that. Oh, so you're absolutely opposed to the arbitrary imposition of authority, except when you agree with it. And then you'll support the authorities against the, uh-huh. You see why you end up talking to yourselves. <laughs> right there, right there. It's just these kinds of simple things which are alienating to people who you're trying to attract. All right. There's a whole complex of this. And it's being played upon in the media from all sides very effectively right now. Right now. The anti woke stuff. Look, Paulette, you told me you're in Florida. You're down there with Mr. Uh, anti woke, you know, DeSantis. And he gets support because the attitudes are off putting and properly so. You can work these things out. But, you know, I came, I spent a long time near Boulder and too much time in the city. In my argument there, I mean, I reduce these to sound bites and slogans for various occasions and purposes, but you know, you're not going to uh, create the revolution by building a better bike path. You know, that was a big thing. We got to have bike paths. And then there were speed bumps. And then there, yeah, you can follow the whole thing. That was actually kind of a rural Western community. When I moved in, it was completely obliterated by the time I left. And I went back an area where I'd lived for 30 years and got lost. There's been so much transformation going in the wrong direction since I left. Yeah. So it's attitudinal. It's attitudinal within our groups and attitudinal in how we stand and between our groups, whatever our groups may be. And in the outreach to that segment, the preponderance segment of the population, which is not part of any of our groups, but obviously isn't real comfortable with the status quo, has no coherent explanation. And where do you go to do that? You know, where do you, where, where do you intersect with them in order to start to provide one or talk through one. You might learn something in the process of talking through it with them as well. I know I have. We might oh, wow. have. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like we have a couple more questions. You want to expound on this a little more? Would you like to move on? I'm, I, I think I've expounded. Enough. Okay. All right. <laughs> so I, um, Milton, did you still have a question? Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, I appreciate um, the knowledge that you've shared with us over the years, uh, Ward, and uh, certainly appreciate the critical uh, thinking that your work has contributed to my observations of quote unquote reality, both on Indian reservations as well as in their interaction with federal agencies and state state agencies. So my question then is really, how do we reconcile the Not Invisible Act Commission, which coordinates several federal agencies, including the FBI, Department of Justice, and state law enforcement, as well as tribal law enforcement? These institutions, you know, some of them obviously, you know, created and perpetuated injustice, you know, murder, et cetera, against indigenous peoples vis-a-vis -vis COINTELPRO and all of the shit that came out of that. And so 
all of this in an effort to address MMDR. One of the things that I see here, though, is that how do we rely upon these institutions that perpetuate injustice and murder to begin to address a really critical issue such as MMDR in the event that, say, the validity of their evidence, their um, uh, investigations, et cetera, are called into question uh, now, given their track record, particularly during the almost 180 degree to their sacred and hallowed goals of, of, of justice during the Trump administration. Thank you, Ward. Hmm. Huh. Well, first off, Trump was Trump. And Trump was clarifying in a lot of ways, okay, because of the outpouring of support he got. And it's not some narrow sector of the population, okay? How do I reconcile with expecting uh, that commission or any other element of the status quo to correct the problems we're dealing with? I do not. You could use them tactically sometimes. I'm on a steering committee for what they call Bobby Rush COINTEL Full Disclosure Act um, group. And I don't expect there's going to be any, uh, I don't expect the act to ever pass for one thing. And even if it did, there would be no full disclosure, whatever. But you can use it as a vehicle, an educational vehicle. The, remains to be seen whether it is effectively used that way but there's there's a good shot at it i don't speak truth to power power has nothing to learn from me they know everything i'm saying much better in some ways than i do i try to speak truth to people okay if you can use the framework of pretense that the feds present as antidotes to the problems in order to lead people to draw conclusions that are antithetical to what the feds want conclusions to be, great. That's what we do anyway. So <laughs> have at it in that regard. But the solution is not in the court of the conqueror. The solution is not in the uh, colonial regime, certainly not in the police military apparatus that enforces it, okay? The solution has to be with us, the broad generic us. And we are way off where we once were. You see the potential, the possibility of something serious emerging, not just a series of street protests that go on for a while or a longer while in this spot or that spot or another spot, but the potential for the kind of outpouring of malaise, dis, dis ease, so forth, that could galvanize something of the sort that you had imperfectly uh, encountered in the late 60s. But it's a potential, and the potential is an unrealized talent. And if the talent's to be realized, it's on us to do the realization. Yeah, and I'll work. Insofar as these aging bones still have the energy to work in any venue that it, that presents a firm possibility of that happening, that's what I will do. But each of you should be doing the same locally and regionally and nationally and it comes up internationally the hooks present themselves you have to seize them as they come along and engage okay i think we have another question um andrew do you still have a question andrew fuller can you unmute yourself And we still yes. can. Okay, great. Good. Go awesome. Um, hello, everyone. Good to see everybody again. Um, I 
uh, Ward, thank you so much for being here tonight. It's incredible mm-hmm. to uh, to hear you talk. As always, I am actually one half of the Leonard Peltier podcast. We spoke with you a couple of years ago and have one episode that uh, talked about your work with CoIntel Pro. Um, yeah. Thank you for all you do. It's amazing to hear you talk. I also told you at the time, I'm sorry, I won't take up too much time, but my wife and her older brother, Eric and Emily Deutsch, took your courses at Boulder. And they absolutely think the world of you. And uh, you are a true intellectual and just the real deal. Amazing to hear you talk. My question is, have you seen this new show called The Anarchists? No. No. (laughs) <laughs> i haven't it just came out it's on hbo if anyone needs my login info i'm happy to send it out um it is really a great show it's very interesting uh but anyway that was my that was my question but i also wanted to just where do say, you get where where do you find the thing it's it's on hbo max okay. it's about a group of americans that moved to mexico um to uh what's the what's the city they moved to anyway they moved to a a city in mexico that used to be popular in the 80s i'm totally acapulco Acapulco, and they kind of get run over by the drug cartels and their factions Mm. kind of break but anyway what you were talking about earlier was making me think of of that and uh anyway i don't do anything for the show so i have no I'm not promoting it or anything like that, but anyway. Of all places, okay. But thank you for all you do. Well, thank you for the tip, and I'll check out the show. Awesome. But what I was going to say is I've not seen the anarchists at all. I did stumble across something called No Gods, No Masters a while back, which is, uh, well, Amazon Prime. I'm not sure which of the channels it's on. It's a three-part documentary history of, of anarchism, which I found very informative, including uh, stuff in well, south of Juarez in Mexico that happened in the early 20th century. I was not aware of. So, you know, we continue to learn. <laughs> and you can draw on pieces of history when well presented, and that documentary is. So... If you got access to, well, I think they call it Prime now rather than Amazon, (laughs) whatever they call it, uh, that should be available on there. Great. Yeah, I just took a note and I will definitely check that out. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Is there anyone else that has a question? Do you want to raise your hand? Okay. Don, you can unmute yourself. Leonard, you said that only a mass public outcry will, will get him out. Do you have any ideas on how we can create that? Huh. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> I really don't, other than step at a time. Do letters to the White work. House work? We are doing um, a letter writing campaign. Is that worthless? No. Um, I hate to sound this way, but I've been involved with Peltier work actively since the 80s. And he's gotten a human rights award. He's gotten 14 million signatures on a petition. He's got a federal judge come on and saying, well, you know, we left him in prison, but the FBI did all this stuff. Well, if we let him out, overturn the conviction, it would impute even more wrongdoing to that. You know, so basically you had a judge saying, they're as guilty as he is, but it didn't go anywhere. And on and on and on. And Paulette will tell you, that I'm out of ideas for variations on the theme, but I'm just one person, Mm -hmm. you know? 
So somebody can come up with an idea of how you light a fire under the public sensibility with all the stuff that going down with this particular issue. Let's go for it. David suggested a naked horseback ride. I'm going to actually uh, interrupt for just a second. Down, we've got a couple other people who also have questions, and we're starting to run out of time. So if we can move on. Okay. Peter Brooks, did you have a question also? Sorry, Don. Mm -hmm. Peter, Sorry, did you yes. have a question on the in the no, comments? I just wondered if there was anything we could do for you, or you know, what would make you happy that we could that you might see from us. <laughs> we can abolish this abomination that we're engulfed in, and. Um, bring it down to manageable human scale, piece by piece, and interactively so. I mean, yeah, that would make me happy. But, you know, there, there, nothing I could say, hey, individually, I need uh, this or that or the other thing. I'm, I'm fine, you know. It's just make forward progress. I hate that word progress too, but make forward digress, digress, something. I'm not a revolutionary so much as a devolutionary, really. Um, don't want to overthrow the government and, uh, you know, populate it with people of like sensibility to me. I want the government gone. That's the thing. If you can accomplish that, I would uh, thank you very much. And all of that, move in that direction. Well, at least you got us started. <laughs> <laughs> Very grateful and we love- US you. out of North America, how's that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you. I have a question here also. Paulette, do you have anything that you would like to say or uh, if we have time, David? Mm -hmm. Paulette, can you unmute yourself on? Right. No, I, I don't have anything. I, I always enjoy, enjoy Ward's uh, discussions. Uh, Bob and I uh, spent lots of time with Ward when he was in Boulder. And, um, you know, the whole question of letter writing. Uh, when Bob and I were in Kansas, we had, uh, I don't know how, we had over a million letters from Russia that went in a circular file that made absolutely no difference to the White House in trying to get Leonard out. Um, somebody said, why didn't Obama let him out? Obama is a law and order president. I, I'm constantly amazed that people don't know what our presidents stand for. Um, and he, he was very clear that he did not believe that you should stand up against this government and that when the FBI agents were killed, then we were in the wrong. So Obama and uh, Biden is his, you know, the guy right behind him. And I don't think Biden's going to do it either. That's not mm. their philosophy. And that's why presidents don't let him out. Now, Clinton was different. Clinton was so dirty. He felt that, <laughs> and the FBI intimidated Clinton. And, you know, but I don't think it was intimidation. It's just not the policy of Obama to support what took place on Pine Ridge. Yeah. You know, Obama didn't even want you to know what he was doing. He <laughs> was prosecuting whistleblowers, more whistleblower actions taken by the Obama administration than all other presidents combined. Combined. Think about that, Mr. Transparency. <laughs> We're just about coming to the end of our time here. Uh, so I want to thank everybody for coming, for your interest, for your questions. Um, Professor Churchill, I want to thank you. Um, this thank you. has been great. Yeah, this has been great. And I just want to um, 
remind or let the rest of you know, if you don't, that we are looking at a, <laughs> speaking of letter writing campaign, um, to the White House, September 12th, which is Leonard's birthday. And that next week, uh, we have Martin Garbus on the 25th. So that should be an interesting session as well. And i um, really delighted to see all of you here. Thank you. And um, I also ready? wanted to, to yeah. thank you also, Mr. Um, Professor Churchill, and invite you to come back anytime you would like. It was such a pleasure um, listening to you. And um, I, it, it just, it, you're welcome to come back anytime. And I thank you for coming. Thank you. Brian, for join the book club. I'll be happy to come back on anytime you want. And I might even, time permitting, sign in for garbage because it'd be interesting, like you said. Do you have any new books coming out, Ward? Um, I got another one on a uh, uh, campaign against the Panthers that should be coming out. I don't know what the production schedule will be on it. But but sometime, maybe in the spring. Oh, next year? Yeah. Spring 2003, maybe. Oh, maybe. Maybe. Uh, yeah, like I said, I don't know what their production time will be on it. Okay. So get that one. No, I, I keep hacking away at stuff. Good. And <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all. All right. And um, if I can talk with uh, Kim and Catherine, or we can maybe do this later. Um, I had something I wanted to show you, but thank you all very much. Good night. All right, have a ple have a pleasant evening. See you next Good week. Yeah. Thank, right. you. thank you. Bye. Thanks. Love y'all. Love you more. <laughs> thank you.